What's up, what's up, family? It's your boy, Reggie Clay, CEO of Rock Square 357 Productions and the producer of They Don't Hear Us. Uh, on this particular episode, we're going to be bringing you uh, two young men that one was convicted of a life sentence for drugs. The other young man was sentenced to 93 years for drugs. Uh, you're going to hear their, their testimonies and their story of how they were sentenced and how they ended up being back out and on the streets again. Uh, the process, the people they met along the way, just an exciting show not exciting as far as like oh wow but to hear from these two men that thought that their lives was over and that they thought that they would spend the rest of their life in prison and to have the opportunity to be blessed enough and recognize that they're blessed enough to be back on the streets again here's this episode of they don't hear us My name is Yvette Dennis, and welcome to this episode of They Don't Hear Us. Today we have Ralph O'Neill. Mr. O'Neill, thank you for joining in today. And i just like to take a moment for you to explain to us why do you feel they have not heard us or heard you. Okay. I don't think they heard me because too many young black Kids are dying and suffering from financial illiteracy. And I don't like it. So I don't think they heard me. Thank you. And I do agree with today's climate. That is a major topic and concern for our community. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, um, I was raised or reared, however you want to say it, in a proper manner. And when I got a little older, I started looking towards the streets, you know what I'm saying? And um, when I started looking towards those streets, it just got a little bit out of character. Um, I can say rose up through the ranks in illegal activity. And in 2008, I was convicted of federal drug crimes. And um, once that happened, I got two life sentences. And um, Obama passed a law in 10 but I had to go to the state for another charge. I was charged with a, um, with a murder. So while I was there, I couldn't take advantage of the law that Obama, President Obama had passed. So after the murder case was over, I came back and I tried to file it, but I was time barred. Laws have all these different provisions in it, so I was time barred. So I was stuck, and then in 2016, I filed for clemency from President Obama, and the people who had charged me with murder wrote a letter on me that wouldn't even, that prevented me from getting out on that. Because usually when you file for clemency or pardons, they don't tell you the reason why you're denied. But mine came out in the newspaper, so I knew why I was denied. Fortunately, in 2018, President Trump passed another law which made President Obama's law retroactive. When he made that retroactive, um, Brittany K. Barnett of the Buried Alive Project, uh, God bless her soul. I mean, Jeff Bezos gave her book of the year, and you know he owns Amazon, so you know she must be a powerful lady. She got me up out of that thing, you know what I'm saying? I came off, home off these two life sentences on the Fair Sentencing Act, made retroactive by the First Step Act. And that's how I sit talking to you right now. That's such a blessing. Like, um, I don't think our community understands how important that um, our president, um, our congressman, um, the governor, all those um, uh, seats, they play a very important role. And they have a lot, a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And to your benefit, it worked. It really did. Um, so now that you're out, what do you like to see happen um, that can help our community? 
First of all, I think it starts with financial literacy. I'll say that until I can't breathe no more. Financial literacy is everything for us as a people and for the nation as a whole. Um, you had these kids. I was one of them who would think, okay, I made a few thousand dollars or I might get a few hundred thousand dollars illegally, and that's some money. Ain't no money for real. And that comes from us not understanding financial literacy. Um, I used to hear the word reparations a lot, and I'd be like, man, these folks ain't gonna give us no money, and it doesn't even make sense to get out here and and try to put a voice on that to get that money, but now I understand it, and I understand why. Because if you were caught up in slavery, that time frame still trickled over and trickled over. These families, they didn't have to suffer from that if they weren't black. You know, they had money or they were just white. And then when you have that skin tone, you don't have to go through the struggles that we have to go through as a black person um, in America. Um, I'm not prejudiced in no way. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a lot of my friends are white. I know you hear people saying that. But... A lot of my friends are white. Uh, a lot of people I know are white. So that's not it. But I understand politics now. And I understand systemic racism. So, yeah. Tell me, how long were you away? Um, I was away 13 years and 8 months. 13 years and 8 months. And how many institutions did you actually... Um, was moved to? Oh, wow. I know at least about five. You know, five. I was, I got two life sentences. I was facing four life sentences because I was on probation for a charge out of Texas when I caught this charge, which led into the conspiracy charge. And in Texas, when you violate a deferred adjudication for that type of felony, um, you're facing 15 to 99. So, when I wouldn't cooperate with the federal government, they put a KPS on me and the state of Texas started offering me 40. And they was like, if we adjudicate it, we can give you up to 99. But I fought that. The lawyer that I paid to fight that only cost $1,000 and he ended up getting that ran in concurrent with my fed sentence. So if I would have panicked, like a lot of people do, um, I would have just signed for that and had 40 years in TDC in Texas. So I was facing that. I was facing a murder charge. Uh, they was trying to give me life on that. And then I got the two lights for the federal drug charge, of which I ended up ultimately getting the first step back by President Trump. So, yeah, I was facing four life sentences. I hit at least six different places, six or seven different places. And, um, yeah. I, meant, I hear you mention Trump. Um, a lot of people have said many horrible things about him, but he has done a lot of good things and um, sound like that uh, the, the law mm -hmm. was able to help you. Mm -hmm. So can you explain to, me, explain to everyone um, exactly what change that, was made, that made you able to come home? Well, my thing is I always would tell my partners and all the lifers because all the life people would talk to each other. And I tell them, man, whatever president gets me out, I'm putting a picture of him on my wall. But I was locked up through four presidents. I was locked up. I got indicted under Bush, was locked up through both Obama's terms, was locked up through Trump's one term, and got out at the beginning of Biden's term. So actually, that's like one, two, yeah, that's four. Four presidents. So, um... All of them actually affected my case except Bush. But Obama's law was made retroactive by Trump. The Fair Sentencing Act was made retroactive by the First Step Act, which reduced my time. I had a little bit of time left. And President Biden came out with the CARES Act, where people was getting the PPPs through. They had a provision in there for prisoners that said if you were low risk to recidivate, you had a low pattern score and you served over 50 percent of your sentence then you could get it you know what i'm saying then you can come out on a monitor and come home so i actually qualified for that i was the second person at the prison to qualify for that the first person i told him about it when he got his sentence reduced and 
That's how it went. What was the age when you um, caught the charge and was actually incarcerated? What age were you? I was 33 years old. You were 33? Mm-hmm. Did that happen? Mm-hmm. And how old are you now? I'm 47. 47? Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. And you've been home? And you've been home how long? Um, I've been home six months. Six months. Mm-hmm. I heard you speak upon your mom mm-hmm. during that time. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me a little bit. What was the... I know she was your biggest supporter, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, my mom was always my biggest supporter. Your mom, nine times out of ten, your mom's going to be the one who's going to be there for you. You know, um, women come and go, friends come and go, but your mom's always going to be there. But, you know, I was blessed, fortunately. All my friends were there for me while I was gone. So that was a blessing, too. I seen so many people that didn't have nothing, no family, no friends. But you don't know what they did to get to that point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, you know, my mom always taught me not to burn bridges, you know. And, um, of course, when you're living a life of crime, you're going to burn some bridges. But nine times out of ten, the people that was in my perimeter, I ain't burn no bridges with them. You know what I'm saying? So I had a supporting cast my whole time. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I was just blessed. And, like I said, your mama... She going to be there for you. People going to come and go. But nine times out of ten, your mom, if she's doing okay, even if she can't get there physically, she going to be there for you in other ways. So, you know, it's a blessing to have my mom there for me. Okay. Now that you're home, it's been six months. What classes are in the institution are you able to use now? Um, uh, anger management. Uh, mollification. Mollification means making excuses. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't make excuses. You know, uh, anger management, that was big. You know, you don't want to let your anger move you. I see it so much out here now from the people around me to the people that I don't see. Everybody got road rage or people act off emotion without sitting back thinking. You know, I've kind of mastered that. Uh, one of my business partners that I had when I first started this restaurant, when I got out, he said, man, I learned from you because I see you don't let stuff get to you. You would just sit back when the old you would have just been shooting off. But now I just like, I just listen. Because nine times out of ten, what I was taught by older dudes is that um, you might be mad now, but give it a little time. You ain't going to be mad about that same thing. But to be aware is to be alive. You have to think, you know, you have to be a thinker. And I was a critical thinker in there. That's why a lot of people acknowledged me and were around me and wanted to be around because I learned how to think. If you don't know how to think, then you just weren't going to survive. And that's what it's about, survival. I mean, six months, you have done and, and achieved a lot. Tell me some of the things that you have done now, six months. Mm, I've created some businesses. I've created a lot of networking, Uh, just a lot of networking. I think networking is key. I mean, my wife would disagree because she always says, are you talking to people too much and being friendly? No. Back a long time ago, I wouldn't have did that. I would have been, I was a hider. I never would let you know what I'm doing, who I am. I'd be in the in the dark, in seclusion, but now I'm out here, I'm free, I ain't got nothing to hide, I don't do nothing illegal, so I'm good, so network, 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 I and mean, that's going to get me to where I need to be. I heard you speak upon your mom, mm. I know she's probably your biggest supporter. Yes, yeah, she was, she most definitely was. Um, as a mom, my son, I'm going to share with you, he was also locked, locked up. Um, incarcerated for 15 years, and that took a, a, a toll on the family. And uh, I'm, I'm, I thank God every day that he was able to um, survive that, um, that period of time of his life. You mentioned six months. Yeah, I've been out six months. And, um, again, the capital that you raise, the companies that you have grown, that is like a big, um, that's a big accomplishment. Yeah, I like, it was proper preparation prevents poor performance, five Ps, um, 
I've been planning for this. So I knew what I wanted to do when I get out. Those who don't plan, plan to fail. You know what I'm saying? So that saying is true. You have to have a plan, and you can't be a procrastinator out here. A lot of us are procrastinators. I was once a procrastinator when it pertained to certain things, but you can't procrastinate. If it's something you're trying to do, go do it. Don't play, because you ain't hurt nobody but yourself. And I also know that um, during that time, um, people have uh, was let go and then went back inside because they did not prepare. They were not able to have that support or those uh, resources to follow through, like jobs. Um, I think maybe if the prison system will reach out to these companies like UPS, um, major truck, um, FedEx, um, even... Um, you know, major companies. I'd like to say that I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And I would like to know if there's anything else that you'd like to say. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Reginald Clay of Rock Square Productions for giving me the opportunity to share a, a portion of my story. I'd like to tell all of y'all to go out to Master Chef, M A S T I R, like you stirring. Master Chef, um, 13,001 Old Hickory Boulevard, Antioch, Tennessee, right beside the TA truck stop, inside the Exxon, new location coming to Almaville Road in Smyrna. Um, be on the lookout for my All Tennessee Network podcast, based off the All Indiana Network podcast in Indianapolis with my first cousin, Tevin Studded. Big shout out to Tevin Studded. Y'all check him out. He the truth out there. So we bringing that same thing here to Tennessee. It's about to be big, y'all. It's going to be big. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Um, this is going to conclude another episode of They Don't Hear Us. Whether you, did you get a life over in, in prison? Yeah, I gave my life to, in 08. In, in prison? Yeah. I bet you. I guarantee every gangster nigga respected what you did, didn't it? Yeah. I guarantee. Yeah, I was on I was on a yard with with nothing but with a bunch of crips that you know I've been knowing pretty much my whole life. Some yeah. a lot of dudes from Memphis, Memphis mob dudes, and so I was on a real tough compound up at Bledsoe. That was about mm -hmm. sixty percent life was up there at the time, mm -hmm. and so I gave my life to Christ right in the midst of that. <laughs> I mean, as soon as I got there, first of all, let me say. Um, in o, in 06, Blesso up in the mountains. Nah, I, I, was, I was at Blesso for classification. Yeah, that's because classification you, now. But you was up there with Toon. Yeah. Toon gave his life over to Yep, sure That's did. what he said. A gangster nigga gonna respect that nigga. <laughs> sure did. I'm, 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 Toon, a gangster nigga gonna respect that, man. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I got to the point to where, like, I had just got 93 years. You mm -hmm. know, for those that, that don't know this, you know what I'm saying? I had, uh, you know, I, I got busted in 06. Uh, um, and they ended up giving me the kingpin charge and gave me 325, a 12, a 4, and a 2, and ran them all wild, man. Gave me 93 years right there in front of my family. 93. In front of everybody, man. Tried to send me away for life, man. And, um, and uh, I ate it, you know what I'm saying? And was the only one that went to prison. For those that don't know, you know what I'm saying? I had a cousin that went, he did about four, three, four years. And, you know, my essay did about three or four years, but I got the chunks because, of course, they wanted—they they always want you to tell, and they wanted me, been wanting me for years. And said an example, I know. Yeah, and so, yeah, I took the time and uh, took it on the chin and really didn't have no, uh, I really didn't have no, no hope at the time. <laughs> Why I mean, would you? I didn't have no hope. So they sent me up in them mountains, and uh, I, I was hustling when I first got in. You know what I'm saying? I got up there and caught me a guard. And, he started doing things for me and this and that, this and that. I, like, I was on the streets. Yeah. You know, and so I hustled for about two years up there. Uh, well, no, not two years. I had two years in this county, and I got out, I got up there. So I started hustling for about, I don't know, probably about nine months, eight, nine months. And yeah. then I got saved. And yeah. right in the midst of everything, all these crypt dudes and that I grew up with, whatever, they was tripping because I came out because I got saved one night. Yeah. You know, a lot of stuff went on, you know, I was, I was losing money here and there and gobs of stuff was going on and just right in the middle of it, I was high when I got saved. And it was, it was, it's hard to believe, but I, he brought me down to my knees. I gave my life to Christ, man, August the 8th, 2008. 
I remember like it was yesterday. And after that, I hit the compound and people was tripping. Like, yo, do you tripping? I'm like, nah, I gave my life to Christ. I'm like, man, you tripping, man. Nah, man, I'm talking about from that day on, I ain't cussed. I don't cuss. I used to cuss like a sailor, bro. I don't curse. Uh, man, I don't drink, smoke, nothing, homie. Huh, so it's, it's you crazy because all the people who really who who really for real about changing their life and they remember their date. Yeah. And you remember their date. The time like too, that. bro. Seven thirty five, like, like right off in there. So I mean, it was just like that serious. kind of it's serious. It was yeah. that it was, you know, and and it change and it and it happens with people differently. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, God going God gonna get you right where you at. Yeah. You know, and when he calls you, you gonna know it. Yeah, a lot of people try to fake it, you know, and pen try to There'd be a way to save them out of a situation, you know, situation go on like that. That's true. Pain. So they try to use that, that God situation to get them out of stuff, but they know the faith from the real. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. one of them things where, yeah. you know, people talk about, oh, you go to jail, then then they want to get saved. Look here, man. That's the best place to get saved. Man, yeah. that's the wilderness, bro. Like, when you in the wilderness and ain't nobody there but you and God, like that's the best time in the world that you can get a relationship with him. That's the best place. Man, look here, you man. That, you in that cell at nighttime, is you in your cell at, or you by yourself, yeah, you your cell, your cell ain't talking to each other because y'all both in your own world. If you got a phone, you're on the phone. If you ain't got a phone, you're still on the phone in your head. Man, it you, was you talking crazy, to somebody. Um, it you was just, I never had no desire after that, like, he took a lot of my desires, you know what I'm saying? It was crazy. Like, I didn't even desire to do nothing but really read my Bible. He gave me a hunger and a thirst for him. I just started reading my Bible. I just, that's all I want to do is study. I, 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 wanted, I mean, I had a table in the pod, and they knew it was the table. I kept my Bible on all day, and I'd be in my word all day. He just kind of he just kind of groomed me, and I just started growing. And then I started watching him move in my life. But, um... You know, when it all boiled down to it, you know, I, I met a lot of people, you know, uh, you know, and you start, not only do you meet a lot of people, you start seeing him work in your life. I start seeing him put stuff, my lawyer became the DA, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, out of nowhere, my lawyer is the main DA. Yeah. <laughs> uh, after my counselor became the warden, me and him was already having church. Yeah. Then he became a warden. So I'm watching God just put stuff together, man. Start yeah. restoring that restoration. Yeah. You know, that's what he mean when they say restoration power. So he started restoring stuff. You know what I'm saying? By my little girl back in my life. And, you know what I mean? Just start doing stuff that I couldn't do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That was out of my hands and I really throw my hands up. Man, he started moving. You know, I wouldn't hustle and I wouldn't hustle for nothing. <laughs> I didn't want to do nothing, man. He started, man, I started getting money orders. I, mean, I started getting J pays. Receipts, you know what I'm saying, and didn't even know who they was from. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even get the receipt. They give yeah, me the, so the paper. I don't know who. I don't yeah. know who sent it. Yeah. So I just started watching him. I'm like, yo. So next thing I know, my safety valve came because the good thing about having a lot of years, like ninety some years, yeah. your safety valve separate. Uh -huh. So your yeah. safety your safety valve separate and meet you. In the middle. Yeah, it, it'll meet you. It's separated because you your your safety valve is with your red date. Yeah. But when you got that kind of time, your safety valve run off from your red day and it separates. So my safety valve was like 10 years prior to my red day. So I got to go up on it. Yeah. And you man, go up on your safety valve. Yeah. And I made it on my safety valve. Dang. That's how I made parole. I went up for parole on my safety valve and made it. Because I know I had a little weak ass sim and the safety valve. It's right there. So when I got to the pen, I had so much time from the county. The safety valve was like two months in the right. when I went up. They like, nah, we're gonna hit you for four years. Yeah, because nobody makes yeah. it. Like we hit you for four years. You ain't got no time under your bill. Man, like, God took man. care of that junk, man. He put it all in position. The warden came to the you know, it was just, you know, it, it was amazing. But um but more so than that, um, as far as, you know, me coming up, um, uh, you know, I just I started from, you know, I came up from a good family, bro. Yeah. You know, my mom and dad are men of God, man, a woman of God. And uh, my brother pastor, man of God, today. Yeah. You know, just me and him. But I got, you know, my uncle, my old uncle was a gangster. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I started hanging out with them. Yeah. The next thing you know, I got that mindset. Mm -hmm. That's all it takes. Yeah. It ain't nothing about it. It's, all, it's a mindset. And then you got, you, you 
already had book smart. Yeah, so I was yeah. already a, a, a smart cat. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah. that mindset, and I try to push this. I push this to a lot of cats. I push this line to a lot of cats because I speak to a lot of people. You know, um, most of my friends are mostly pastors and bishops and so on and so forth. We just like you and me. Mm-hmm. You know. We kick it just like this, you yeah. know what I mean? But uh, that's my accountability. That's what keeps me grounded. Mm-hmm. That's another thing that we lack. You know, if you, you know, a mindset is is, is, is is a poison thing, bro. You get a man come from a, a moral-based family, biblical family, and put him around a bunch of crap, he gonna take on that mindset. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it's unbelievable. That's why I preach to children. They say they the worst ones because yeah, yeah. they come from a crib. But you put them in the wrong environment, they're going to take that mindset yeah, they, It's they, a mindset. They, they want to get away from that, that environment just to see what this is like. And once they get it, they, they, they stuck. They they gonna, they, it's it. the mindset. I, they took me over. So next thing I know, my uncle, gangster. He Everybody know Kendall Moe. And, and, and he was paralyzed from the waist down. Had more power than anybody in, the, in, in Nashville. <laughs> From north, south, east, and west, he was the most powerful figure I, in this city. I'm from the city. I heard his name before. <laughs> and that know. was my uncle, you know what I'm saying? I don't so, know him, but I, I heard his name. Yeah, I was living with him. He up there with, them, with the two brothers named the McQuitties. Yeah. And, uh, like, they they, man, they he, names that you going to know in the city. Dude, this man was a gangster, man. And so I started being around him. And, you know, I took on, you know, I go to college. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm moonlighting, doing this and this and that. And, Next thing you know, I got that mindset. I'm looking at what he's doing. I'm like, yo, I could do this. I'm going to do it this way. And next thing you know, I end up getting a plug. Next thing you know, I'm in Miami. <laughs> and next thing you know, I'm gone on. You know what I'm saying? That mindset that I took over now, I'm finna rule the world. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's what I did. I had it all to be. I had car lots, beauty shops, bottle shops. You know what I'm saying? Record companies. You know what I'm saying? Auto, audio shops. Yeah. I had to own the only Costero shop. On the overall times line, I had that when they weren't even doing it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The one right there by the Crow, uh, Kmart. Yeah, the one right there by uh, Thompson Lane in Nova Road. Oh, okay. It's an okay. Echoes okay. now, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it used to be the car stereo oh, yeah, shop. Yeah, yeah, Everybody yeah. went there. Yeah. I ended up buying it from the Cubans. So I ended up having that. Then I ended up getting a car lot on Bridge Church Pike. Then I moved to Murfreesboro Road and big car lot. So I was just moving. I bought a ranch in Mexico and, you know, 7,000 acres. <laughs> and, we coming up out of there, and uh, yeah, 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 it was yeah, a, it was it was unbelievable. That's why, so, that's why, that's why, that's why they wanted to calm you down. Like they like, man, this black nigga moving. Man. They knew. What the fuck is this boy? Man? What that's what that's what Tennessee in the Ville came from. Yeah, I'm the one established that. I can put that on camera right now. Like everybody knew that's where they came from. Because I was they, God was Certified already getting them for that. So I we was pushing that pistols, pushing that in the yeah. raps. Yeah. Ten of key. Yeah. Ten of kiss where yeah. it came from. And so, um So how you broke ass rifles. <laughs> Every time I then ain't he ain't never been ten of key. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you yeah. got a legend right here saying you a goddamn lie. Yeah, yes. It was a ton of key. It was a ton of key. You ain't loyal, man. That shit fuck up your street cream. Your street cream. Your street cream. They ain't put in work. That's why your ass ain't got no street cream. No street cream. No street cream. Yeah. Real recognize.